the recording is on. I see sound waves. Okay. So, I like to start my sentences with the word so, I have discovered. Okay. The silence of having recording being on. Welcome to Stumpinar number two. This is going to be about glaciers in general and Matanuska Glacier in particular. I am your host, Aradiopedia, the rock expert. Um, if you're in the Great Stump, you will have just seen some cool rock pictures that were rock, were two rocks that were collected at Man, Man, Mantauska. I can't say it. W words are hard. This glacier in Alaska, um, they were collected there and given to me at SpoilerCon 2019, and they're super duper cool, and they look like they're made of, um, granite with uh, quartz that got into the cracks in them, but I'm going to talk more about those later. The first thing I want to talk about is glaciers in general. So what is a glacier? A glacier is a body of ice that is sliding downhill. Sometimes there's so much of them that we call them ice caps because they've all joined together and become a giant three mile thick cap of ice. Looking at you, Antarctica. Um, so what is ice? Ice is actually a mineral. Fun fact, the definition of a mineral totally includes ice. It's a non-organic crystalline solid of natural origin. I actually kind of forget the exact definition of what a mineral is, but as you can tell from the clicking, I'm going to Google it real quick. A mineral is a solid, inorganic substance of natural occurrence. Yeah. So yeah, Satan, it's because it um, is a solid, it gets to be considered. Um, you have lots of minerals that are pretty disorganized. It's not like because it's crystalline and perfect. I mean, gold is like a lump, you know. But the fact that it's solid means that ice is a mineral. So, nonetheless, it behaves like a fluid um, under, under pressure, under, over time, it actually will deform like a plastic or in a plastic way. So it's kind of like a fluid. Um, the reason that they flow downhill is because of gravity, like everything, and it's still water for all that it is a mineral. It's still water, so it will go downhill and it will find a way. Um, so under, sh so it doesn't have any, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It basically has no resistance to shear strain. So it will flow like a river and that there will be places that flow faster and places that flow slower. It doesn't actually all move as a solid piece. It, there's a, a channel in the middle that flows much faster than what's on the edges. Uh, what's at the top flows slower than What's at the bottom? You can tell this if you uh, drill a metal rod down through like 30 feet of a glacier and then come back in like a week or whatever the appropriate time is for the rate of that glacier. It will be bent into a J shape because the bottom is moving much faster. So glaciers move not just as a rock falling downhill. They actually move on a cushion of water. And this isn't just because of meltwater that flows down from the top. It's actually because if you increase the pressure on ice, you depress its melting point. So a really cool experiment you can do just with household supplies is take an ice cube and suspend it between, you know, two edges of a plate or two blocks or whatever and get like a paper clip or something, piece of wire, and hang something heavy like a fork or something off of it. I think it was a fork that my geology teacher used in class. And the weight of the object pulling down on that wire that is laid across the ice cube will actually melt its way. It'll depress the melting point right at that point of contact and it will start cutting its way through. But as soon as it's gone, the water above it will refreeze because it's, you know, in the middle of an ice cube and so its temperature is still very cold. So it will actually 
melt and heal its way through the ice cube and fall down in like I think it took us like five minutes or something so that proves the point um also that's how ice skating works that's why you get to be so slippy on ice skates it's not because ice is slippery it's because your weight on the metal blade is creating a little line of water underneath you that's pretty yifty I didn't last time I went ice skating I was just tripping out on that so hard <laughs> like wow this is how it all works um yay I'm blowing people's minds this makes me happy um so that totally is happening under a glacier you've got you know meters and meters and meters of ice pushing down on the rock you're gonna get quite a bit of melting so this is the main way that the glacier both moves and how it does a lot of its erosion that you don't see until after the glacier is melted and gone. So like, presumably we all know that rivers make V-shaped valleys and glaciers make U-shaped valleys. And a lot of that has to do with how the glacier is eroding, obviously, underneath itself. So a main way that that happens is called regulation. And that means that, so I'm going to go back a real quick second. So, you know, everyone knows that there's like a lee side, you know, of a rock or whatever. You know, you get in the lee of the building and then you hide from the tornado that's tearing through while the epic music proves that you actually have a love interest in your dude or whatever. You know, not quoting tornado at all. So the opposite of a lee side is the stoss side, S-T-O-S-S. -S. So with regulation, you have more, p you've got a bump, you know, in the rock. And that bump is going to be, you know, as much as a half meter or above a meter. This process only applies to those two things. And then there's another process for objects in the middle. So basically, you have more pressure on the stoss side of a bump. So you get melting. And the water melts, and then it flows around to the lee side. And it will refreeze there. And what does water do when it freezes? It expands. So you end up with this pushing on one side and then this expanding puddle of water on the other side. Or maybe the water doesn't uh, refreeze and it just sits there and accumulates. And eventually, the little puddles will all connect because there's so much water under there if it's not refreezing and expanding and moving on down the hill, it's collecting. And eventually you can end up with a rather large cushion of water if all of those things connect. And that can then float the glacier, radically reduce its friction coefficient. It'll slide down much, much farther. Or much faster, I mean. If you have a bump that is between a half and a full meter, roughly speaking, then you can end up with this cool process called cavitation where again you have like an ice ramp on the stoss side and puddles accumulating on the lee side and you'll end up with kind of this stair step that's pretty jagged and the corners are going to be way more prone to being snapped off or broken off because I have physics equations for it because I learned all of this from a physicist <laughs> um, but basically you've got way more force on a corner than on a slope. So if you get these little corners, those are going to end up snapping off quite a bit. And that's called cavitation. So that's kind of how you get a lot of the erosion happening on the bottom. Glaciers form because you have a, a constant interaction between accumulation and ablation or melting of snow. So a glacier is ice that accumulates year after year after year, but they're always flowing downhill. So inevitably, they're going to be getting into an area where they're losing mass because it's too warm or it fell into the ocean or whatever. So they have to be continually recharged from above. And there's an equilibrium line that moves uh, up and down altitude according to the season, according to the climate. Um, you know, it, it literally will move uh, just because of the seasons. But also, you know, when we have climate change that's making the glaciers retreat, we're not talking about glaciers literally running uphill because it's water. It doesn't do that. What we're talking about is the equilibrium line is going up the body of the glacier. Um, 
I like to say um. Okay, so I also posted a really cool picture in this channel uh, yesterday as a little teaser, and it basically showed a Grand Canyon-esque uh, meander of river going through a glacier. And that's because you also have meltwater forming on top of the glacier. You know, in a puddle, bare ice is darker than fresh snow. Um, and if you have a puddle, that's going to be much darker than bare ice or fresh snow. So it's going to be a positive feedback loop that increases the amount of melting that's happening on the surface. It will flow downhill, start forming rivers and waterfalls, uh, will make caves. There are actually some crazy people that go caving inside glaciers and ice caps. Probably more often ice caps than itty bitty glaciers because these things change really freaking fast. But um, there's some pretty epic like waterfalls that you can observe vanishing into a glacier or rivers flowing along the surface. Yes, Andy Lujan, it sounds dangerous because it is incredibly dangerous. Um, the uh, If you have ever been interested in uh, Mount Everest, you'll know that one of the most dangerous parts of Everest is getting up through um, the ice fall. And that is basically the bendy part where a glacier is changing its angle as it's coming down over a lip of the mountain and getting through that is super, super dangerous because, yeah, the stuff changes in a matter of hours. Ooh, we have a distraction from Desmond Sedai, a glacier that is actually advancing in the U.S. and calving more, too. Hubbard Glacier in, shocker, Alaska. <laughs> okay, cool. So its status is that it's going into the ocean and it's advancing. So probably that is the result of, so advancing could mean two things. Either there's more ice getting added to it because there's more snow falling on top, or I would suspect more likely, because Alaska's warming faster than many places, that there's a greater amount of melt that is helping it shift downhill. So, oh, you're saying more precipitation? Yeah, that totally works because... Yeah, you've got more up there. It's going to be pushing harder to come down. And the point of equilibrium might not be changing, but the, the balance of how much ice to how much melting is possible can be changing. And yes, Satanus, it, it almost certainly is a mixture of both because there's this obnoxious thing where nature doesn't read textbooks and tends to never be simple and nothing is ever unconnected from like literally everything else. Um, also more precipitation could be falling more as rain than as snow, which again would be adding to the amount of liquid lubricant essentially that's under it. Um, also as sea level goes up that can help float the glacier more and unpin it from the friction on the seafloor that it's going to be pushing against. Because, you know, ice floats, but if it's in three inches of water, it's going to still be resting mostly on the, the um, seafloor. So if sea level goes up, that can help float the thing a little bit more, which essentially unplugs it. That's a lot of what um, people have been worried about with Antarctica and the collapse of the sea ice. And, you know, people are like, oh, well, that doesn't add water to the ocean because it's already in the ocean. Yes, this is true. But if that plug moves out from in front of a landbound glacier, now it can slide into the ocean a lot faster, and that will add to the amount of mass in the ocean. Hey, Anna just joined us. Hi, Anna. We're talking about glaciers, as I may have said 75,000 times in the last three days. Trophic cascades. I can almost imagine what that phrase means, but I've never heard it, so I am going to do a quick little Google. I can totally imagine what it means. Powerful indirect interactions that can control entire ecosystems, or in this case, geologic systems. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool and terrifying. This is, as most natural processes are, 
Uh, Kelsey, you've seen glaciers? I've never seen a glacier. Well, no, that's not true. I have seen glaciers in the Cascades, but at a distance. I've never, like, been up close and personal with a glacier. I've never gotten to hear a glacier. Very much something I would like to do. Because I've heard they sound really grindy and trippy and terrifying. Of course, you've skied on a glacier, Anna. You're from the magical wonderland of all things European. They're super loud, Kelsey? That's cool. Yeah. I've yeah, I've been close enough to the Cascades that you can see them, but I've never never gotten close. It's a goal. But um yeah, they're really really pretty. Okay, I am being delightfully distracted because you all showed up and are giving me all kinds of ego strokes and it makes me happy. Um, no, please do not be sorry for distracting me. I'm just trying to uh, keep things on track. I don't know if Switzerland's a magical wonderland. I just figured, you know, Europe, it's, it's the old country. Dun, dun, dun. Ooh, and Desmond Sadai has posted a picture of the glacier, which I hate the way people say glacier. I cannot deal with it. It's one of the few things I don't like about David Attenborough. He says that. Oh, and here's a nice definition of a trophic cascade that's been posted. Ecological phenomenon tri triggered by the addition or removal of top predators and involving reciprocal changes in the relative populations of predator prey through the food chain. Ah, that totally makes sense. If you take away the wolves, the deer get out of control, the trees get overly predated, the river starts eroding a lot more, the fish die, so on and so forth. Nisqually Glacier on Mount Rainier is what this picture is of. Yeah, that would make sense. See, and so you see in that picture how it's really, really dirty. That's another, like there's more dirt on it than really visible ice. That's another sign that it's retreating really fast um, because you have so much of the rocks and sediment that are in the glacier sitting on top of it. Um, and that's just accumulating faster than the glacier's retreating. Also, that increases the heat that can be accumulated by the glacier because, again, rocks are much darker than snow and ice. Anna, I want to know the German word for glacier. Unless you mean that the German word for glacier is fun. <laughs> Which I doubt, but I want to... Gletscher? Gletscher. Huh. That's definitely better than glacier. Oh, sweet. Yay. <laughs> she said my pronunciation was perfect. Wahaha. And there's a lovely picture of Kelsey on a boat with a glacier behind her. Oh, yeah, that's a pretty color of glacier. That teal turquoise color. I love it. Speaking of ice caves, I got a cool picture um, as I was prepping this to show you what the inside of an ice cave looks like because it's got all these cool scoopy sort of textures. It looks like someone went through there with a giant ice cream scoop and was like whacking everything and then it all melted enough to get smooth but it's still got this very scalloped sort of texture which is just seriously Google ice caving and be super excited by it. And another picture of dirt and ice on the glacier. Yeah, so that's another thing I need to talk about if I ever get back to topic is um, the debris erosion that happens with these things. And since we are 20 minutes into this, I should probably attempt to get back to that. And yeah, we're never going to be able to tell the Kelseys apart if they both post snow pictures. We're screwed. Watching Discord. Dun, 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 dun. We are all one Kelsey. Yes. Okay. Erosive force. So, as I said, glaciers uh, 
change the shape of valleys from a V-shaped river valley to a U-shaped valley. And they also make this really cool thing called, um, all right, following my notes. So they smooth down corners, but they do not shape debris. This is really important. Rivers will round the rocks and sediments that go through them. Glaciers don't do that. They're so solid that they can't, once you have, like, if a rock falls onto a glacier, it's not going to change in its shape as the glacier goes downhill. It's not, if it gets embedded inside the glacier, it's not going to change shape. So the debris that comes out of a glacier is going to be just like a rock fall, just chunky, angular, that's the word, angular, um, pieces. But they also make this really cool thing called a hanging valley, which if you've ever looked at pictures of like Glacier National Park or anywhere that used to be heavily glaciated but no longer has any, you'll see these weird U-shaped valleys that hang far, far above the valley floor and have that same beautiful U-shape, but they just like come out and then there's a sheer cliff below them. And I will try to find a picture. I only had some pictures in my notes before uh, we started because I was trying to not get overkill. But I don't know the meaning of not doing overkill. It's a thing. Okay, here's a cool picture of one. It's like, uh, oh, what even is this? It's like it's a very well forested area. I think it's a Norwegian one, so maybe that's real. Um. Yeah, none of these pictures are the perfect picture that I want. Um, ah, here's one from, oh, I don't know, the whatevs. Oh, and I see that Leah has posted a nice picture of Nantanuska Glacier. So there, in that picture, you can see there's this U-shaped thing, and then it just drops off, and there's a waterfall pouring out of it. Um, so that happens because basically there's a lot of little like tributary glaciers coming into the big one. And so they can't, um, they can't erode farther down than the base level of the glacier where they meet it at. So then when the glaciers retreat, you get this high water mark basically that tells you the glacier used to be up that high. So if you ever see those hanging glaciers, you can then instantly know that you the entire distance between you and where that hanging valley is up above you was all ice all of it and leah's telling me it's pronounced matanuska matanuska cool thank you i will attempt to remember that when i get to talking about your glacier so for erosion we've also got cirques which are C-I-R-Q-U-E-S, which I've seen in some of um, Canadian Kelsey's pictures when she goes hiking. Um, well, rock climbing, whatever crazy shenaniganry she's doing. Um, I've seen her go up to somewhere there's, it's basically like, like this circular space where the peak of the mountain w never had a glacier on it because it was too steep. But the glacier was trying to work its way back. Um, because things like ice plucking, ice wedging, it ends up creating this nice bowl that's kind of the home of the glacier. How do you spell cirque? You spell cirque C-I-R-Q-U-E-S. Oh, and Desmond just posted a picture of the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. At the end of the last ice age, the mountain had glaciers. It's a smooth, round mountain at the top, and you can tell glacier-shaped topography. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that kind of thing. You have this smooth, bowled-up thing, and often it will have a lake in it, because ultimately the glacier will, like, retreat so far and melt so much because it's dying, right? But there's still a puddle of water. At, the, at some point, it ceases being able to flow out and over, so you get a pond, basically, at the top. And uh, there's also these things called coals, C-O-L. And that's where, like, a glacier actually went over the ridge of, like, the flank of a mountain. I think, I'm not positive, but I think Hillary's step on um, 
Everest might be something like that. Possibly. I don't know. That's just always my assumption when I look at the pictures. But yeah, I don't know. I've been very obsessed with Everest for a while because <laughs> it's so scary. And as we were talking about at SpoilerCon, getting to base camp would be like bucket list item. Like I'd never try to climb the actual thing. But if I could get to base camp, man, that would be so cool. So we've already talked about plucking the um, cavitation process that plucks rocks um, off of the valley floor or also off of the sidewall. I mean, you can imagine if there's an elbow of rock sticking out into the path of a glacier, the glacier is going to be like, no, and snap it off and carry it downhill. And that's why you get those really steep, smooth sided valley walls that are down to the bedrock. And you also get polish and scratches, um, which is basically when a rock is embedded in that ice body because, you know, it got snapped off and it's now embedded in the sidewall of the glacier. It's going to fingernail scratch its way down the wall that it's next to. There's actually um, some really all over the world. Actually, you can find these scratches sometimes in places that you would never think to have glaciers like. Australia um, and those are evidence first of all often for uh, the fact that the climate has changed really radically uh, over time and it's also evidence for tectonic drift the notion that the plates of the earth like the continents move around one of the ways that people have that people proved that way back in the day Alfred Wagner and others mostly Wagner because nobody believed him at the time, and it's sad. Um, it's really sad, actually. He died before his theory was accepted, but whatever. The point is, one of the pieces of evidence he used was that you've got glacial deposits, including these scratches, these big, gnarly scratches, ground into the bedrock in very disparate places all around the world. And it's like, how how the hell could that have happened? You don't get sea level glaciers at the equator it's just not a thing it's too warm there um but if those rocks used to be much farther north or south then they could have moved down there through tectonic activity checking discord again i see everest was a potent topic of conversation so yeah i read into thin air also kelsey and that's what started my obsession with everest I just read everything Krakauer had written, um, and then I read a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, I I know about the the various bodies up there. Also, the like piles of human waste that are starting to melt and fall down the mountain because it's not staying frozen anymore. But yeah, all the bodies. One of my worst nightmares ever in my entire life. Like still to this day, top top tier nightmare had to do with being on Everest. And I don't even know why the dream wasn't that scary, but there was just this emotion in it that was so terrifying. I think it's because I watched like a documentary about, yeah, you, you're hiking up there, da -da 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 -da, and then there's like a body here and a body there, and it's like, whatever. And apparently my nine-year-old brain was not okay with that. one of the many reasons why I will not be climbing Everest. I do not need to become one of those bodies. I don't even need to see them. It's just totally unnecessary. But yeah, it's, it's too much effort for them to bring bodies down because you tend to die in the most extreme locations, right? Like in the death zone and nobody wants to spend energy recovering your body. Well, screw that. But there's also other really sad stories where people like didn't get help as they were dying because everyone's too obsessed with their climate push or with their uh, summit push. Also, like your your ration rationality gets really fucked when you have that sort of oxygen deprivation. So like you get tunnel visioned in. But there's there was a documentary I watched a while back that uh, was talking about a woman that literally died while many people walked by her and just you know she needed help and nobody was willing to risk not getting to the summit to help her, basically. Oh yeah, Desmond, I do remember reading about that, a corpse that had super old school, like a century old climbing gear. I remember reading about that and thinking, what? 
yeah, Kelsey, there's a lot of ethical problems with climbing up over that high. I'm just like, I mean, Darwin Awards, I guess. But then there's like the fact that a lot of people, you know, exploit the resource or get locals to help them in really dangerous situations and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of the Sherpas go up in like sandals and they make the same trip 20 times where, you know, some American with like their insulated electric boots or whatever is like doing it once and they're like, oh, I'm such a badass. And meanwhile, like all their gear got carried up by Sherpas in fucking sandals. It's really problematic on a lot of levels. <laughs> Okay, Everest, such a lovely distraction. Covered in glaciers. That's part of why it's uh, shaped the way it is. Um, kind of like the Matterhorn, it's glaciers trying to form and glaciers actually forming. That's what creates those sharp peaks. It's not like um, like the, the Rockies, how they're, or the, the Cascades, where they're very shaped by uh, tectonic forces or by volcanic forces like stuff like the Matterhorn like that shape that shape is because ice okay I need to get back onto my topic because I want to talk about stuff depositional force so in addition to taking rocks apart taking mountains apart taking landscapes apart they also make floodplains they make river valleys they make beautiful hills um, so our favorite character of all in Wheel of Time, aside from Baron and Bella, is Moraine. She is effectively named after a pile of unconsolidated glacial leftovers. Um, a moraine can be either terminal or lateral or medial, depending on where it is positioned relative to the glacier. But it's basically, glaciers are like conveyor belts of rock. They're bringing all of this rock down and depositing it. So you'll end up with, um, if you see them from the air, you'll see these long snaky lines of dark material that look almost like traffic lines or something. They, they're currents. They show the currents of um, glaciers. And let me get another picture. Google thinks I'm looking for moraine. No, I'm not. For once, I want the geological phenomena. Oh, perfect picture. Putting a picture into chat. So here in this, it's an aerial view. You can see mountains in the background and you can see the uh, moraine pointing towards you. And you can see a long brown line going straight and you can see some other brown lines that are curving. And those basically represent the middle channel of the main moraine and then some of its tributaries coming in. So like I said, rocks fall on top. They don't really sink down through the glacier, they just sit on top. But the way fluid dynamics work and stuff, you end up with them fairly self-organizing. Also, like they gather heat during the day, so they shed the snow that lands on them, and it's sort of a positive feedback process that accumulates more visible sediment in the middle of the moraines. So those are your medial moraines. You'll also end up with lateral ones if, you know, say they come out into an open space and they start collapsing off to the side, or just, you know, the so much rock falls at the edges, right? You've got like it's carving a cliff into a sheer wall and you've got rock falling down onto it. That rock isn't going to move to the middle because the glacier is going to be a little bit domed just because reasons, I don't know, physics. So you'll end up with uh, moraines along the side and then terminal moraine is obviously the moraine at the terminus at the end of where the, the moraine or where the glacier is dropping stuff off. So there's a really excellent, um, while Googling, there's a really excellent example of this in, wow, I cannot type and talk, hold on. In Northeastern Oregon, there is an absolutely stunning example of this that is literally textbook. It's the first place I saw it and I visited it a couple years ago. I have tons of pictures that I've never sorted out and I totally should. So basically, it was a glacier that came out of the mountains and has now retreated, and there's just a little bit of it up in the mountains. But it left a perfect horseshoe of debris from its lateral moraines and its terminal moraine that have blocked in a absolutely gorgeous lake. And there is a town, the town of Joseph, that is sort of at the bottom of that. 
And if you look at the picture in Discord, you'll see there's these weird lumpy snaky things coming out from it. Those are what's called eskers. E-S-K, E-S-K? Where did I write that? Yeah, E-S-K-E-R-S. And that's basically you'll have, so the meltwater's coming out from underneath, right? And it will melt a tunnel, basically, underneath the glacier, because, you know, it's flowing along the top, it vanishes into the glacier, it does its cavey thing, and then it flows out. And it's, it's water, so it can carry rocks. It can carry sediment and uh, erode it in a more normal fluvial fashion. And you'll end up with these, these molds or castings almost of those river channels in these things called eskers. Um, so these moraines that you can see here in the picture, I actually camped on the very edge of one of them. They're basically a pile of the most disorganized rock you can think of. Everything from rock flower, which is the finest, siltiest grade of rock you can think of, all the way up through boulders the size of school buses. It all gets transported equally. And that's, if you dig into those things, into those moraines, that's what you'll find. The eskers will be a little bit more organized, like a stream would be organized. Oh, Andy Lujan, you had eskers in your hometown in southwest Pennsylvania. That makes sense because the glacial ice sheets, the continental ice sheets of our last glaciation came down to Pennsylvania, New York. There's a bunch of, of awesome stuff that tells us in those regions that tells us a lot about the last glacial maximum in North America. Like the, uh, what is it? There's these, these hills in um, New York State that basically tell us the direction of the glacier, which, I mean, it's pretty north-south because it was expanding south. It's not that stunning of a revelation. But yeah, eskers totally make sense because you'd have these massive rivers of meltwater coming out from the continental ice sheet. So then we get to talk about one of my favorite things ever, which is the Missoula floods, which if you know anything about uh, North American geography and Northwest American geography, you probably know about the Missoula floods. Um, basically, you had some glacial ice sheets coming down and blocking rivers, creating these massive lakes. And then periodically the glaciers would melt slightly. You know, the, the ice sheet would retreat just a smidge. Ah, thank you, Desmond. That is a lovely illustration that you just posted in Discord that shows the ice sheet and the glacial lake Missoula that got formed. So periodically the ice dam would melt back a little bit. And then you would have floods on a scale with you can't imagine. It's millions upon millions of cubic feet per second. It, it's obnoxious. It's like the, the Yellowstone of flooding, so to speak. And it basically stripped the topsoil out of Wyoming. Like, just, no, this is, this is coming with us now. And it went rushing, rushing, rushing down to the Columbia. It's, um, if you drive through the gorge in uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, well, there's a lot going on there, but several of the, um, there's some notches you can see in the gorge, and those mark Missoula flood events because there was so much erosion. Um, the coolies, if you're familiar with the coolies, um, those are narrow areas of rock. Those are areas of rock where a narrow channel got forcibly widened in a period of a couple weeks. Um, we've got all kinds of weird, weird rocks over here in uh, Washington, Oregon that represent that, you know, the rocks that you would find in Wyoming, but they're in Western Oregon. And it's like, how did you get here? They were rafted in on icebergs that came through these things. Basically, you have, you know, because the ice dam would start to break up and bye, Kelsey. Thanks so much for showing up. So, you know, this ice would break up and it would get broken up right and so it the rocks embedded in those ice chunks would get shoved many hundreds of miles sideways and then they would drop their rocks off elsewhere um where i live in the willamette valley where the guys live for the podcast um it's very very fertile here and also a lot in um washington there's a lot of fertile soil 
and that's because the water would get literally uh, dammed up by how much water needed to get through these narrow choke points and a bunch of the sediment would settle out and so we have up to 40 meters of beautifully excellent uh, rock silt and Wyoming topsoil that got deposited here while all the water was trying, trying, trying to get out of the Columbia. And it's just, it only flows so fast. Even when you're eroding the rocks like crazy, the, there is still a limit. It doesn't happen instantly. There's also some ripples in um, eastern Washington that like, they just look like, you know, ripples, like you'd see at the bottom of a stream, right? Like ripples. And then you you notice that there's a little a little road and there's an 18-wheeler truck that looks like a toy in front of these things. And these are current ripples that were created by just millions of cubic feet a second of water moving. And this happened many, many times over the course of the last glacial, uh, the last ice age. This happened many times. It wasn't just a one-time event. So those are some of the most profound floods ever really, really strongly influence where several of us in the podcast community live. Um, yeah, super, super cool. And yeah, we have literally a bathtub ring around the Willamette Valley at about 200 feet or so. And that represents how deep the lake would get. And that bathtub ring is of those weird rocks, like strange granites. Like we don't have granite out here. Granite is not a rock you find in Western Oregon, except for these boulders. And it's like, I'm sorry, that, that doesn't make sense until you include these crazy, crazy floods and the, you know, ice debris that was carrying rocks on the way down. And yeah, I would love to study more about that stuff. It's super, super cool. If you ever want to look it up, check it out. It's uh, M-I-S-S-O-U-L-A for Missoula. So see what Desmond has to say while I drink water. Hope my voice isn't too raspy. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. You have granite where you live, but it's in the form of huge rocks. Yeah, you live near the terminus of a glacier in Puget Sound. So yeah, again, you're getting you're getting rocks from far up into some mountains farther back that have come down through that. You don't have the granite forming locally is basically the idea. There's also, um, going back to like uh, Pennsylvania or, or New York or something, you'll have what's called glacial erratics. These big, giant rocks that just are in the middle of a flat plain and there's no other rocks around and you're like, um, did you land here because of aliens? No, they were dropped there by glaciers, which then retreated and left the rock all by itself, feeling sad and alone. Or not. I mean, maybe they liked solitude. I don't know. I'm not going to judge a rock for hating to be around other rocks. It's a thing. Okay, where am I? So we've also got a cool landform called tarns and kettles, which is basically when the glacier is retreating, it'll break off and leave basically icebergs, but on land. And they will maybe be very heavy, have a lot of water, and they'll end up creating like basically a cirque, but just in whatever landscape it's found, it's found itself in. Um, I can't remember where, but there's, there's some landscapes in the world that are just pockmarked with these things. So that's tarns and kettles. Uh, rock flour is basically flour-sized particles made of rock because lots of erosion that happens at the bottom of glaciers. Abigail was telling me that Toronto was covered with glaciers. And I don't know if they carved the Niagara Escarpment. I would assume that Niagara Falls somehow can, can point to glaciers as having helped them come into existence. I don't know specifically. You'd think I would have studied it more, but I don't know. I'm kind of like, it's so popular, I'm not even going to pay attention to it. Snobbishness, like, because I'm a hipster geologist. <laughs> um, icebergs. Let's talk about icebergs. So iceberg icebergs calve off of glaciers as they meet the water. 
and basically like ice floats right and if ice didn't float then we would not have a planet like we recognize because then all the water would like sink to the bottom of the ocean in its solid form and then we would be snowball earth and it would be very sad there would be no no life as we know it so oh bye andy thank you so much for uh joining us and this will be posted to youtube after i edit it together well edit it after i post it oh satanas posted a cool Valley carved by glaciers a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, you do live in Flatland. But yeah, glaciers give no fucks about Flatland. They will just ice cream scoop their way through that down to the bedrock. Basically. Which is pretty cool. I'd love to go back to uh, Northeast Oregon and check out more of that stuff. Because, like I said, I live in the results of glaciers, but not in a glacier area. It's a very scientific term, Satanus. Ice cream scooping is, is... I did not just make that up. That is totally scientific. I made it up. But, I mean, it gets the idea across. You know, it's like it's a visceral, you can connect to it kind of thing. Right. Icebergs. I'm talking about icebergs. It's going to happen. So the ice floats, and eventually it, you know, melts... Um, you'll get cracks, like these ten tension cracks, basically. And eventually they break off, and they do not add to sea level. I just need to reiterate, when ice is floating, it is not adding to sea level. It is when it gets off of land into the ocean that it adds to sea level. Very important. Um, and they will bring rocks with them, because the rocks are embedded in the ice. And there is a really cool, so I don't know how many of you have watched One Strange Rock on Netflix. Um, it's hosted by Will Smith, and it's a cool, like, National Geographic whiz-bang science documentary thing. And it's really fun. I don't really like National Geographic's overproduced pseudo-religious overtones, but whatever. Um, we were watching an episode, my husband and I were watching an episode about it, about the moon. And he was talking about how the moons, you know, pull on the tides. And he was talking about how in Alaska, um, indigenous people would actually go beachcombing, but under the ice, because the, the water would retreat, but the, the ice, you know, it's just sitting on the, on the beach. But you can kind of go into, you know, those caves, basically, there's like caverns underneath it, right? Because the water was floating the ice and the water goes away. But the ice is, you know, supporting itself on rocks and just being solid and so there's a couple of hours when they could get in under that ice and go like you know picking mussels and stuff like that and they had to be really really good at knowing when the tide was coming back because once that ice starts to rock and shift like your path out might close up and then you're trapped underwater or under ice while the water comes in that would suck so in the context of that episode, it was talking about how they had to get really good at knowing the way that the moon influenced the tides and when the tides would be the, the lowest and how long they would last and this whole connection with the moon and, and stuff. And I just, I had never thought about that as, as a hunting mechanism. And it was just like, almost gave me anxiety watching it because it like, this is one of the most rapidly changing environments that you could possibly go muscle hunting in. Like, ah! So scary. Um, but yeah, super, super cool stuff. And obviously, indigenous people, total badasses. Desmond is saying, the tides in Alaska come in at almost running speed. Yeah, that is fucking terrifying. Also, I'm enjoying my proposed stump in our titles. Glaciers don't give a fuck, and those mountains don't need to be here anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, glaciers give no fucks. Wow, the tides shift 30 feet from high to low. I wonder if that's a function of, like, why is that so fast? Like, I know, like, the Bay of Fundy, the the difference is, like, 70 feet, and it happens really fast, but that's because there's, like, such a difference. Yeah, it's like, that's the textbook example. But I'm, like, wondering, like, why? Oh, yeah, people would die real easy. 
from tides. I mean, even here on the Oregon coast, I mean, people don't die from the tides coming in, but people die from being dumbasses around the ocean, like, all the time. I've also read that that's possibly one of the more um, valid explanations for the parting of the Red Sea. It also uh, happened to Alexander the Great, that under the right tide conditions, and especially with the wind pushing the right way, you could end up with the Red Sea, like, retreating and opening up a land space. And then when it came back, it would just come in, like, like instantly, basically. I'm pretty sure I read an account about Alexander the Great wandering around out there, and he basically had to arrange his men into, like, a spoke wheel pattern so that they could find, like, the way out. You know, they would go in a direction until that the man on that direction, like, got into too deep of water, so then they could, like, shift to another direction and, like, get their way out like that, but... You know, maybe Moses really knew all of that stuff super well and picked his exodus um, at one of those times when it's like, okay, guys, we have two hours. Run like fuck. And then Pharaoh's like, oh, this is a weird act of God. I'm just going to go through it too because it's fine. And then the ocean was like, time's up. I'm coming back in. And then they all drowned. It makes more sense than divine intervention and walls of water suspended to either side. Understanding of uh, natural forces makes more sense. So, but I am curious to know, like, I guess it's just a difference in height. It's just like a difference between the height of low tide and high tide. You still have the same amount of time to make that difference. So the rate of change is going to be corresponding to that difference. Vlad is saying... Red Sea is a good place to swim in, but he's never seen him split. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's like the wind and the tides would need to be well aligned to make that dramatic of an effect. But, you know, the mechanics are all there in just a regular tidal cycle. It's a weird place to swim in. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it's super shallow compared to, like, most oceans. I mean, I live on the Pacific Coast, like... The ocean gets real deep real fast out here. The concept of a shallow sea is like, but then is it really even an ocean? Okay, so my next note is ice caps. Basically a bunch of glaciers joined together, and then it's more of like an ice cap. Antarctica at its deepest has about three miles of solid ice. Yes, Anna, I am an ocean snob. This is true. Um, yeah, Antarctica is, I saw a really cool animation, I think I posted it in the Brown Aja, about, um, some new science-y McSciences that happened to see what's happening under the ice cap of Antarctica, and there's, like, a giant mountain range, there's, like, a canyon that rivals the Grand Canyon, there's, like, all this amazing topography, it's not just flat, but it's just, it's under three miles of ice, so that's the thing um so yeah ice caps are super super cool and have changed a lot about our world a lot of the geomorphology that many of us here have discussed that we live with is the result of glaciation from the last glacial maximum that was several thousand years ago so now that it's been almost an hour because <laughs> i don't know how to shut up i now want to get to is when she told me how to pronounce it. <coughs> Leah, how do I pronounce your glacier again? Bye, Abigail. Thanks for joining us. Oh, also, Lyra Bell. Welcome. I don't know when you joined, but I'm glad you're here. Matanuska. Matanuska Glacier. So, a while ago, Leah commented in the Discord server, I'm on a glacier. Please explain how glaciers are a thing. And so I hopped into Discord and I gave an hour-long lecture on ice and glaciers. Fast forward to SpoilerCon. She gave me these cool rocks, which if you scroll up a whole bunch, you will see these pictures. And I'll also describe them. Yeah, you did miss my <laughs> lecture, which is part of why I was like, I have to do it again, because you literally missed it and I didn't record it. This is being recorded, kids. It's going to go on YouTube. 
Um, so I'm going to describe these rocks that I got given that were collected at Matanuska Glacier. So they're a gray-blue sort of rock that's pretty fine-grained. So that to me says that it's granite. Granite being a intrusive igneous rock, uh, meaning that it was li was liquid and then cooled, was hot and then cooled, all while staying under the surface of the of the land. So I think it's it's probably granite. Which, having looked at the geology of the mountain range, the Chugach Chugach, I don't know how to say it. I looked it up. I know how to spell it. C H U G A C H. That's the mountain range that this glacier flows down out of. It's part of the Pacific mountain, Pacific Coast mountain ranges, which are basically all formed by subduction. Um, so magma coming up and cooling in below the surface, it, it works geologically. So I'm not probably super wrong about these being uh, granite. Could also, wait, why am I saying granite? Look at my notes. I thought about this all before. Okay, scratch all that in the post-production that won't happen. I think that these are basalt. <laughs> um, the big black boring rock, as I've had it heard it described. Um, so yeah, it's kind of bluish, pretty fine-grained. So if it was basalt, it could have cooled at the surface or uh, slightly under the surface, um, but not deep, not like granite. I was totally wrong about granite. Um, Granite's a whole different, it cools much, much slower, you get much larger crystal grains. But the really notable thing about these rocks is not the bluish portions, but the streaks of white crystal that are totally strongly permeating through them. And basically, generally, this sort of thing is probably, Anna, I do not hate on basalt, I love basalt, but it is a big, black, boring rock, so... <laughs> but it tells you lots of cool stuff. So generally, if you find a rock out in the world and it's got a white, shiny crystal in it, that is almost certainly quartz, SiO2, silicon dioxide. It is carried by water, and it can be precipitated out by water. So probably what happened is this basalt formed, had cracks in it, had water flowing through it, and that water deposited a bunch of silicon dioxide. And now the cracks are completely filled with these gorgeous crystals. And it's very streaky. It, it almost looks like water flowed through it, which literally is what happened. Nine times out of ten, when people hand me a cool rock and say, what is this crystal? I say, water precipitated quartz, because it's really freaking common. Ooh, Anna just posted a really cool picture in Discord, and it is of columnar basalt, which basically is total tangent. So if you get a bunch of basalt that flows like overland all at once, hey Seth, if you get a bunch of basalt that flows overland, it can flow really, really thickly. Like the Columbia Gorge is a great example of this, or like Anna's saying here, Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. As it cools, a little crack, it'll, con it'll contract, right? Because that's what things do when they cool, except for ice, because ice is special. Um, it will cool and it will form little cracks and those cracks will start to align together um, in ways that have to do with physics and crystal shapes but mostly just thermodynamics and you'll end up with hexagonal columns that can be many many meters tall i actually uh where i grew up in eugene there's some excellent rock climbing that was visible from my brother's bedroom window on a nearby butte and it's these columns that are slowly tipping over. But um, yeah, it's these big, tall, hexagonal columns of basalt. And it's super, super cool. And yes, Amy, I totally empower you to post all the cool pictures of Man Ma Matanuska Glacier. So yeah, Amy handed me these rocks. And they're pretty rounded. I mean, there's some angularity to them. There's some sharp corners. But they are not recently shattered off of a rock face. And I suspect just based on that, that she did not pick these up off the surface of the glacier. I suspect she picked them up from the outwash plain, where water is running out from the glacier and carrying a bunch of, uh, of the sediment and stuff out, and you get basically a, a river that's just rocks. There's no sediment, there's no trees, there's no fish, but you still have a lot of, well, you have sediment, you have rock sediment. Um, 
And she's confirming that I'm right about that. It was towards the trailhead to get onto the glacier. So yeah, you you didn't pick these up while you were clambering over ice. You picked them up while you were admiring the ice you were about to clamber over. So those were neatly eroded by all that glacial water. And uh, so yeah, I was super cool when she handed this to me. I was like, I can tell you so much stuff right away and I'm going to stump an R on it. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about the mountain range. I was looking it up a bit. Um, couldn't find a lot of very specific stuff, but essentially the mountains are part of the Pacific Basin uh, edge of mountains, which, so basically like North America is um, overriding the Pacific plate. North America plate is moving west and a little bit north and the Pacific Plate is being pushed out from um, spreading centers way far out in the ocean or along the edges, actually. I don't quite understand how the Pacific Basin works. Like, I've tried, and I don't understand it. But um, ocean crust always subducts under continental crust, but you do get mountains that get raised up. Like, it's crinkly. You know, it's if you push your hand into a blanket, the blanket's going to crinkle up. That's basically what the entirety of the western edge of North America is doing. Actually, South America, too. It's all that giant chain of mountains that runs from Alaska to the tip of South America. It's, they're different mountain ranges, but they're all being created by more or less the same process. And so this mountain range, uh, Chugach, Chugach, I'm making all kinds of people cringe super hard, and that's okay. Um, is one of those mountain, one of those mountain ranges. Um, just for funsies, the glacier, if you look it up on Google Earth, it's located in Alaska at around 61 north, 147 west. Latitude, longitude. I don't know how many people care about that, but I mean, 61 north? That's really far north. That's really, really far north. This only goes up to 90. It's zero to 90 going up north, so... That's a ways up for comparison. Seth and I live at roughly 44, 45. So that gives you some idea of how much farther north it is. Oh, that's a picture of you drinking glacier water. Awesome. Not necessarily the cleanest water in the world because all water in the world is polluted. Thank you, Sky. Really, really appreciate that. But man, I bet that was cold. Desmond posting a cool picture of rock forests in China that formed during the Cretaceous period. Those are not formed by glaciers, no. That is formed by limestone getting eroded by groundwater and rainwater. Um, whole different process. But they are very, very cool. And I would have no problem discussing limestone landforms and a future uh, Stumpinar, because landforms are awesome. Okay, what else notes did I have on the geology of these mountains? Uh, just that erosion is a thing. As uh, Oh, Leah's telling us that the glacier moves at about six inches a year. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's not super, super fast. Um, yes, Anna, I would love to walk limestone pavement in Ireland with you. That would be awesome. Oh, Leah's comment about the rate of the glacier moving reminds me. So remember earlier, way earlier, hour plus ago earlier, I was talking about how um, water accumulates under the glaciers in these little pockets and pools. So in the springtime, there will be a lot more meltwater under glaciers than during winter. And you'll end up with things called spring surges. I think this is really common in um, like the actual Alps in Europe. That where we get the word alpine from because everything has to be named for European stuff um, you'll end up with the glaciers will surge forward by like feet a day sometimes because all this water will build up will float the glacier and then it all flushes out and the glacier comes back down to rest on the rock but glaciers move as much as a few inches a day or a few feet a day or as little as a few inches a year it really depends on this, the angle of the slope, how much meltwater you have, 
if the glacier is accumulating or uh, reducing, there's a lot that goes into it, but they do move. They all move. None of them hold totally still. Ooh, Leah posted a video. And it's loud, and I'm turning that off. But running water, panning up. Oh, yeah, see, you're down. You are in a... She, okay, so this video is showing her being down where the, the meltwater is carving its way into the glacier, and then she's looking up at the sky, and there's a slick wall of ice over her head. Well, not over her head, but right next to her. And it's, um, you can see how the, the creek is actually going into the glacier and it goes into a tunnel. Some people would go climbing down into that. I'm pretty sure I saw a picture once of someone kayaking a fucking river that was doing that. And I strongly encourage nobody to do that because that seems insane. Um, yeah, that's a thing. So that's the end of my notes. It's been a little over an hour, so I guess if you guys want to ask me questions or or whatever, um, I can't record you if you're doing voice because I don't have that. I don't know if I could do that while I'm recording myself, but if you guys want to type questions or, I don't know, post more cool pictures, <laughs> I probably should like try to wrap this up at some point but uh yeah that that was the end of my notes for talking about glaciers i'll just look at my other notes while you guys type Yeah, it's pretty much all my notes now. Oh, you're so welcome, Leah. I'm really glad you were able to make it to this one and, like, participate live. Aw, Desmond, thank you. I appreciate that. Wait, how are you a fellow brown? Your name is still orange. Do I need to put you in the brown? Did you lose your brown status? You're brown in spirit. Well, we always accept more quiet nerds in the brown, Aja. It's a thing. Oh, glad. Thank you. It's uh, really fun when people want to hear me rant about rocks and, and stuff. Oh, your first chair on the White Tower Discord, Desmond. Okay. I see you, fellow first chair. My dad has actually told me that he doesn't like going on hikes with anybody other than me now because I'm the only one that he's like, everyone else is boring because <laughs> I'm, I'm just ranting about geomorphology everywhere we go and uh, apparently nobody else does that aside from like my mom who's who I learned it from <laughs> oh good Satanus I'm, I'm glad I could distract you help, help you cool down a bit if you'll forgive the pun <laughs> um yeah, glaciers are cold. Glaciers are cool. And uh, they're likely to go away over the course of the next couple centuries, but they are going to, some of them will go away faster and more erratically than others. In Hebrew, you don't even have a different word for glaciers and icebergs. Com contrast that to like Inuit people that have the hundred different words for snow. Oh yeah, Anna, you told me your your brother is is like me. He's a geophysicist. Blah 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 blah. Rocks this, rocks that. But I mean it's like every boring little chunk of rock at your feet tells an amazing story. If you can pick up a rock, it will tell you so much about the history of our planet, about the history of your location. It's it's one of those, you know, to explain anything you must first invent the universe kind of deals, like there is no such thing as a boring rock. I mean, if it's like the fifth rock of the same type you've looked at, yeah, maybe it's a bit boring. It's like, oh, it's sandstone, and I'm in the American Southwest. Shocker. But still, like, knowing that there's an obnoxious amount of sandstone in the American Southwest tells you all kinds of stuff about this shallow intercontinental sea that persisted for millions of years and helped the 
evolution and development of all kinds of Cretaceous era plants and animals and stuff like that. Satanus is saying we need to have a chat one day about the philosophy of rocks and Eastern philosophy. I am so down. I don't know anything about the philosophy of rocks and Eastern philosophy, but that would be super interesting. <clears throat> <laughs> My fellow first chair is saying that during the mini ice age, the Vikings and Scandinavians had religious ceremonies praying for glaciers to stop eating their towns. That sounds super legit. Hey, Leah's got to go. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a super fun prompt for this. Yeah, Satan has totally sent me supplementary materials. I will send you back pictures of the museum in Japan that has rocks that look like faces. <laughs> what's that word for uh when you see faces in everything or just when you see faces there's a word for that that's what happens to you in your brain it's there's a word for that it's a squishy science i don't do squishy science so i don't know i only do hard science this is why i got into geology it's because i didn't want to deal with social science or anything biological so okay i think i'm gonna cut recording because that was very long